afternoon everyone. ITEC welcomes all the participants for today's National Distance Learning Seminar Series. Today's topic is Pharmacology and Toxicity Profile of ARE Drugs and speaker is Dr. Sonali Salvi. Dr. Sonali is working as Associate Professor in Department of Medicine, BJMC Pune and is also an active CESEP member at BJMC ART Center. She has special interest in HIV TB medicine and hypersensitive drug reactions. She is also a member of Associations of Physicians of India, Geriatric Society of India and IMA. She has many national and international publications to her credit and also the co-author in the chapter H1N1 in pregnancy in the book Pregnancy Medicine. She has been awarded Best Doctor Award at Sassoon General Hospitals in the year 2014. We welcome you madam for today's NDLS session. I would request Dr. Sonali now to kindly take over. So uh, today's presentation, we are very sorry for the interruption, but uh, I think we have come over the technical problem. Uh, so, so let's start with the case one. We have a 45 year old asymptomatic male with type 2 diabetes mellitus since last five years who comes to the ART clinic with following blood reports. Hemoglobin 10 gram percent, blood urea 45 milligram percent, serum creatine 1.8 milligram percent and urine albumin 2 plus. Cases like these are very often uh, seen in our clinical practice and sometimes it becomes very difficult to determine whether the underlying problem or whether the underlying laboratory abnormality is because of the disease per se or because of the treatment he is receiving. We will come back to this slide again once we are done with all the adverse effects of the concerned drug. So let's first go to the basics. Hello, yes, classes of ARV drugs. So we are going to discuss briefly about the drugs available in NACO program. There are a variety of drugs available, but through the program, whatever drugs we are getting, we are going to be discussing about those. So in the <coughs> NRTI group, we have nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors, zidovudine, stavudine, lamivudine and abacavir. And in the uh, nucleotide reverse tra transcriptase inhibitors, we have got tenofovir. And in the NRTI group, we have Neverapin, Ifavirens, and in the integrase inhibitors, we have got Raltigravir. Amongst the protease inhibitors, we have got At Atazanavir, Ritonavir, Lopinavir, and Darunavir. So, let's see first about Tinofovir disoproxin fumarate, also known as TDF. The oral pile availability of this drug is 25%. After taking 300 mg orally, maximum serum concentrations are achieved in about 1 hour. Half life is 17 hours and persist in peripheral blood cells much longer. Now this is the basic concept. We have to remember all these basic concepts about the drug because once we have started with this drug and later on patient develops, <clears throat> later on patient develops uh, any drug reaction, it may be concerned to these uh, pharmacokinetics of the drug. So what is, how do we deal with tenofovir toxicity? So first let's see what are the features of tenofovir toxicity and what are the symptoms and signs the patient is likely to present with. Tenofovir affects three main systems in the body, the kidney, the bone and the liver. Symptoms may be from very non-specific symptoms. Most of the patients will be asymptomatic and they will be detected only when there, <coughs> there are laboratory manifestations. So the symptoms will be reduced appetite, weakness, myalgia, nausea, vomiting and in only severe cases we find oliguria. Basically, tenofovir toxicity presents as non-oliguric renal failure rather than oliguric renal failure. So only very severe cases you will get the complaint that the patient has no, uh, passed less amount of urine or less than 400 ml per urine, uh, 400 ml of urine per day. Dyspnea is another symptom which is seen as a part of tenofovir toxicity. It may be multifactorial. It may be because of the acidosis or it may be because of the uh, effect on the bone marrow or the uh, blood. There <coughs> also you have to take history of co-medications like history of use of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. 
like diclofenac which is very commonly used for joint pains and several other conditions acyclovir also is a very commonly used drug and it is a nephrotoxic drug and ritonavir also uh, may add to the toxicity if it is used along with it now the signs abdominal tenderness may be occasionally seen and you have to check a mylis for that for hyperamylasemia muscle and bone tenderness will be seen in few cases because uh, tenofovir toxicity also affects the bones increased tendency to fractures will be seen as a part of chronic toxicity acute jaundice with hepatic enlargement is seen as a part of involvement of the liver but this finding is not very common but still if the patient is on tenofovir and if you find a person with hepatic enlargement you have to look for tenofovir toxicity tachypnea in a person on tenofovir you have to always rule out lactic acidosis as the underlying cause because the patients may present with severe tachypnea and sometimes the uh, cause may be very difficult to identify unless you have a high grade of suspicion for the same now let's look into the pathophysiology this it is very important to understand how and why tenofovir causes nephrotoxicity now the proximal tubule in the kidney is a very important structure in that there is active transport of sodium this transport of potassium and glucose and amino acids at the same time are being transported in and out now the very fact that you have a problem in this it leads to proximal renal tubular dysfunction also known as fanconi syndrome it presents as a renal tubular acidosis so amino acid urea glycose urea with normoglycemia this is very important you have a uh, presence of glucose in the urine but the blood sugar is normal this is a very important fact fact and you should always correlate the urine glucose with the blood glucose uh, in such a case amino acid urea <coughs> may be uh, detected in the uh, urine sample you can do a bedside dipstick test also hypophosphatemia and hypouricemia these are very marked features and hypophosphatemia at the same time along with these two will be a hallmark feature of tenofovir toxicity tubular protein urea also may occur and <laughs> whenever you have tubular protein urea again this condition especially when we go back to the first case the patient had protein urea so diabetic nephropathy also leads to protein urea whereas tenofovir toxicity may also result in tubular protein urea so how do you differentiate between the two you have to look at the fundus in a case of diabetic nephropathy you will have changes in the fundus in the form of diabetic retinopathy but occurrence of diabetic retinopathy will say will point towards more uh, of a nephropathy rather than tenofovir toxicity now osteomalacia is an indirect result of tenofovir uh, induced uh, bone marrow uh, tenofovir induced uh, bone uh, metabolism uh, impairment and this uh, feature will not be observed very early on it will be as a result of chronic tenofovir toxicity now all these the good thing about it is all these features resolve within about 5 weeks after discontinuation of the drug so it is important to identify and discontinue the drug as soon as possible in 50% cases the resolution occurs without any sequelae in a remaining 50% you may be having a prolonged course of the illness and you may require dialysis in the form of peritoneal dialysis or hemodialysis now the decision to dialyze or not comes up later first let's see the grading of tenofovir toxicity as per the rise in creatinine above baseline so in grade 1 you have something more than or equal to 0.5 mg per deciliter rise in serum creatinine above baseline in grade hello hello in grade 2 we have got a creatinine range of 2.1 to 3 mg per deciliter and in grade 3 we have got creatinine range of 3.1 to 6 mg per deciliter now these are for the purpose of classification <laughs> now whenever you have whenever you have such a finding it is always important to know whether the clinically whether clinical signs of uh, renal failure are present and also 
the patient whether he is in encephalopathy so presence of uremic encephalopathy flaps and rising acidosis are indications for hemodialysis hemodialysis should be done as soon as the uh, patient is uh, detected of having such uh, acute kidney injury findings and it should not be delayed in most of the cases now these are the uh, routine investigations that are to be performed the urine dipstick test the urine routine microscopy albumin and glucose serum uh, investigations the urea level blood urea level creatinine level uric acid level calcium and phosphorus levels now <coughs> treatment first of all stop tenofovir then you have to monitor renal functions weekly but this this is applicable to patients who are asymptomatic and you can follow them up on weekly basis in the rest of the cases it is always preferable to advise the patient to get admitted to the nearest center or if it is available at your center it is always better to hospitalize the patient now there are two options peritoneal dialysis versus hemodialysis both have got its own advantages and disadvantages wherever possible hemodialysis should be the mode of treatment in such cases now in peritoneal dialysis uh, the uh, mechanism of uh, dialyzing or mechanism of re reduction of the urea or the nitrogenous based products is similar but it takes lot of time and the technique or the uh, high or the uh, associated uh, sterile precautions these are to be taken and it has to be done with under expert guidance hemodialysis also requires expert guidance and lot of facilities so the choice for both should be decided before you uh, before you refer the patients and always a nephrologist opinion is uh, desirable wherever there are doubts now in case of tenofovir toxicity uh, this dipivoxyl uh, <coughs> salt has got its own adverse reactions in future we have got drugs in pipeline which i have mentioned hexa dicyclo oxypropyl tenofovir the name sounds to be very long but cmx 157 is a short form it is less efficiently transported into and less cytotoxic to the proximal tubular cells hopefully drugs like these will improve the uh, future of these patients who are associated with tenofovir toxicity to summarize the findings or to summarize the things we can monitor the patients as per the hiv medicine association of the ID idsa guidelines every 6 months renal functions serum phosphorus protein urea and glycosuria monitoring should be a routine in all patients who are on tenofovir with glomerular filtration rate 9 less than 90 ml per minute per 1.73 meter square now we have got a formula available uh, like cockroff gold formula also we have got inbuilt uh, uh, inbuilt applications for, uh, in which you can enter the patient's creatinine value patient's age and patient's body weight to get the gfr so this gfr measurement seems to be a very important point in the patient management also you have to look at other comorbid conditions like for example in our case we had a case of diabetes mellitus who was already on treatment and had established uh, evidence of nephropathy such patients tenofovir should be avoided and they <coughs> any other drug should be started in place of tenofovir co treatment with protease inhibitors though we we do not have such patients but sometimes they may require treatment uh, uh, with protease inhibitors and simultaneously they have uh, renal dysfunction however we have to be careful uh, whenever such a combination is being used and we have to uh, monitor the patients as per guidelines so whenever uh, you have a first time uh, coming up patient say you have to initiate the patient on art you will always monitor the patient or always screen the patient for an ultrasound of the abdomen if there are any structural problems if there are any stones that is renal calculus disease then such patients you have to better avoid tenofovir as a starting agent to avoid further complications also the renal size estimation the report on the ultrasound should mention the normal renal sizes if the renal sizes are small that is if the kidneys are shrunken it is better to avoid tenofovir this is a, a very precise chart uh, 
measure the uh, GFR if the estimated GFR as per the Cockroft Gold formula is less than 60 ml per minute, assess the patient for age, body weight and other renally excreted drugs, measure every 3 months for 1 year and then biannually and stop the drug if significantly sustained changes in any of the uh, 4 parameters that is EGFR, fractional excretion of phosphate, urine protein creatinine ratio or urine glucose. Now number 2 and number 3 investigations, the fractional excretion of phosphate and the urine protein creatinine ratio may not be possible at your setting. But the urine glucose estimation is a very easily done test and that can be even done with the help of dipsticks. You can monitor the patient with uh, that and you can have a creatinine clearance estimated and that is how you can uh, stop the drug <laughs> with close monitoring. Now let's see what are the other effects uh, apart from the uh, kidneys. So tenofovir effect on the liver. Though this is well documented, tenofovir causes increase in liver enzymes. That is, uh, you have a hepatitis with rise in AST and ALT values, that is SGOT and SGPT values are high in these patients. Lactic acidosis is not a reported, uh, not well reported. It is a rare manifestation. However, it can occur. Severe hepatomegaly with steatosis is still um, um, documented in various studies and there, there are fatty infiltrations of the liver and can occur with tenofovir use alone or in combination with other anti-HIV therapy. May not have increases in liver enzymes that is transaminitis may <coughs> be absent. Only hepatomegaly with steatosis may, may be present. Uh, these findings are more in women and obese patients. So if you have a female gender and a obese uh, patient with uh, hepatomegaly, you have to first screen for other hepatitis, that is hepatitis B and C. So rule out other conditions which are causing uh, liver, uh, fa fatty liver and then try to come down at uh, this. So this will be a diagnosis of exclusion. The tenofovir toxicity on the liver will be always a diagnosis of exclusion. Let's go to case 2. We have a 34 year, 35 year old female presenting with easy fatigability and exertional dyspnea. She has been on ZLN regimen since last 6 months. So this is a very common scenario. We have got uh, some female patient who is on Zidovudin therapy and presenting with exertional breathlessness. So what could be the different possibilities? The first thing that strikes to our mind is the most commonest adverse event with, uh, with which zidovudin presents that is zidovudin induced anemia. So let's go on to see what are the several toxicities of AZT. So we can divide these toxicities into short term use the toxicity resulting out of short term use and out of long term use. So headache, anorexia, nausea, vomiting which are a part of gastritis. These seem to be most common and you have even seen them in patients receiving PEP. Tachycardia, myalgia, fever, rash, hepatitis, these are less common ones. And lactic acidosis is a very uh, uncommon uh, type, not very commonly seen nowadays. Rather it used to be very common earlier but now with the availability of better drugs and with the reduced use of zilovudin, this finding is not of very common occurrence in a clinical practice. A mimic of GB syndrome that is patient can present with quadriparesis can also occur as a part of zidovudin but this is a very rarely reported manifestation. However, you should always have it at the back of mind and you can suspect it once you know it. Long term use you have anemia, nail pigmentation, lipoatrophy, myopathy, cholestatic jaundice. So these findings let's see them one by one. So nail pigmentation. Nail pigmentation is a very com common occurrence. Uh, it is as you see, I will show you with the help of pointer. So see here, this is the base of the nail or the lunule. The pigmentation in AZT toxicity starts here that is the base where I have kept my pointer and if and as the uh, 
a uh, pigmentation proceeds it proceeds from the proximal to the more distal so it starts from the base and progresses more towards the distal end now we also have got other forms of hyperpigmentation like the knuckle pigmentation this also can be a part of azt um, <coughs> induced toxicity now this is a pigmentation seen over the tongue so most patients who remain asymptomatic or do not have any cosmetic problem the drug may not be changed so pigmentation if the patient has a uh, cosmetic disfigurement or has problems associated then you may have a change in therapy otherwise change in therapy is not recommended only for pigmentation now what are the investigations to be performed in case where azt toxicity is suspected hyperlactatemia lactate levels may be desired when the patient has persistent vomiting irrespective of, uh, despite of your uh, treatment like antacids antiemetic drugs so lactate levels can be measured and uh, you once the lactate levels go more than 2.4 millimol per liter it is called as hyperlactatemia whereas lactate level of more than 5 millimol per liter amounts to lactic acidosis so these are the defining variables lactic acidosis of any sort the is an indication for stopping as is it now complete blood count is also very important because you come to know with what type of anemia it is so azt may not be the contributory factor always when you look at the cbc or the hemogram the hypochromic microstatic picture does not indicate anemia related to azt hypochromic microstatic anemia could be because of blood loss anywhere in the body so if you have a normal normochromic normocytic anemia or if you have a megaloblastic presentation with a rise in mcg that points towards azt induced anemia whereas hypochromic microcytic anemia points towards a occult source of blood loss and patient should be evaluated in detail for blood loss anyway with anemia of less than 9 gra 9 <coughs> gram percent is an indication to stop azt ecg is also indicated because when the patient complains of dyspnea or complains like chest pain we have to do an ecg to rule out any ischemic changes myocardial ischemia can worsen the lactic acidosis and lactic acidosis worsens the myocardial contractility so these two are interrelated things and one must always have a look at the ecg to find out any ischemic changes at the earliest any ischemic changes should prompt you to stop the drug and get the patient admitted for further investigations and treatment now let's see the treatment of azt toxicity in mild cases stop at azt recovery occurs but is typically slow one to three months are required before return of liver enzymes and lactate levels to return to normal rechallenge may lead to recurrence and should always be avoided and in such, such cases do not replace or switch with divanosin and stavudine because these two drugs also have a high propensity to cause lactic acidosis in severe lactic acidosis and hepatic steatosis <coughs> also known as nrti associated lactic acidosis the term is called as nala you have to hospitalize the patient iv fluids should be administered except ringer lactate because ringer lactate may worsen lactic acidosis so patient can be treated preferably with normal saline to start with and later on dextrose normal saline bicarbonate infusions help the patient in most of the cases but if even if with uh, rehydration if the patient does not in, improve you have to start them with bicarbonate infusions and should be corrected as per the acid base deficit for that acid base um, blood abg that is arterial blood gas monitoring is desirable levocarnitin therapy in the dose of 50 to 100 mg per kg per day has to be initiated and it has helped now various studies uh, report controversial uh, results uh, in some studies l carnitin has shown beneficial reports uh, anyway it can be tried as a adjunctive therapy but 
still normal saline or the hydration therapy with bicarbonate infusions remain the back backbone of therapy in such cases cases refractory to intravenous hydration may be referred for hemodialysis and bicarbonate dialysis for patients unresponsive to intravenous soda bicarb bicarbonate dialysis is a special type of dialysis where bicarbonate di dialysate is rich in bicarbonate and it has the special indication in cases of lactic acidosis mechanical ventilation is required in very few percentage of cases usually the above measures the patient with the above measures the patients respond very well intravenous 20% glucose decreases lactic acid has been, and it has been studied in several um, uh, several uh, trials now intravenous 20% glucose if it is not available you can try even with 10% of glucose which is easily available a combination of 100 mg thiamine 20 mg riboflavin to 200 mg of nicotinamide and 20 mg pyridoxine and 20 mg pantothenic acid this cocktail regimen has been used in some studies with good results as in cases of lactic acidosis the mitochondrial uh, uh, mitochondrial cycle is disturbed and oxidative phosphorylation requires thiamine and riboflavin along with the atp uh, generation which requires uh, niacin or nicotinamide so this combination has also helped at various studies you can try this combination along with the other ancillary measurements ancillary measures what i have already discussed now let's see about lamivudin lamivudin is the best tolerated drug amongst all however there are reported adverse effects like neutropenia headache nausea skin rash and pancreatitis especially in pediatric patients so always whenever a pediatric patient or a patient with less uh, with body weight less than 30 uh, kg has been initiated on uh, lamivudin uh, and the patient complains of abdominal pain please get a serum amylase or a serum lipase to rule out lamivudin induced pancreatitis however all these adverse effects which i have mentioned have not been very commonly reported <coughs> they are uh, to be evaluated and it is a diagnosis exclusion once again lamivudin hypersensitivity now this uh, form of hypersensitivity is again not well very well documented there have been reports uh, several case reports of lamivudin related skin rash however first it is our duty to rule out drug rash because of nevirapine and ifavirenz before coming at a conclusion that the rash could be because of lamivudin now you can get all forms of rash right from mild maculopapular rash to serious forms like steven johnson syndrome it is often undiagnosed or attributed to nevirapine or ifavirenz as i already said one needs a high index of suspicion to diagnose a case of lamivudin hypersensitivity now the treatment is to stop lamivudin and start the patient on antihistaminics and corticosteroids very few cases or cases which present with steven johnson syndrome have to be hospitalized ifavirenz this is again a very important drug hello we have to be um, uh, very uh, knowledgeable about this drug because this is uh, the uh, primary stay or uh, the main stay of the the drug uh, nnrti which have, we have been using uh, as we have discontinued nevirapine as the backbone therapy now the half life of this drug is 40 to 55 hours this should be remembered and <coughs> why this this should be remembered because we have once we have stopped this drug or once when the patient has had any toxicity the half life of this drug if you keep keep it in mind the symptoms may continue to occur even after stopping the drug so do not panic just stop the drug and wait till the half life of the drug is reached and the plasma concentrations may <coughs> come down so plasma concentrations of ifavirenz may persist at therapeutic levels for 2 weeks or even more after discontinuation of ifavirenz so this fact should always be remembered now what are the cns adverse effects 
the CNS adverse effects that is a higher central nervous system adverse effects they are a combination of neuropsychiatric symptoms vivid dreams nightmares insomnia dizziness headache impaired concentration attention span <coughs> depression hallucinations exacerbations of psychiatric disorders psychosis and suicidal ideation now these are all the psychiatric neuropsychiatric symptoms which have been observed in clinical practice now at least some of them are observed within the first few doses in more than 50% of patients now typically they start on the first day or even at the first dose of the ifavirenz and they take time to subside up to second week or, or up to third week at least 25% of your patients will be free of these adverse effects and at least by 6 weeks most of the patients should be symptom free however patients who have predisposition to these disorders may take time to settle down now risk factors pre existing or unstable psychiatric illness use of concomitant drugs with cns effects and genetic predisposition now once a patient already is a known case of psychiatric illness it is better to avoid ifavirenz as a form of therapy so patient can be initiated on alternate first line regimen now if the cd4 counts are high on the higher side it is always to start the patient on <coughs> baseline regimen like pinofavir with lamivudine and <coughs> substitute difavirenz <coughs> substitute difavirenz with either atazanavir or lopinavir if the patient is on concomitant drugs like anti epileptics or if the patient is a known case of seizure disorder it is better to avoid ifavirenz in such cases thirdly we have got many patients of cns tuberculosis in cns tuberculosis ifavirenz may add to the symptoms and so ifavirenz should be should be avoided in such cases also okay so ifavirenz how do you manage such a patient ifavirenz is to be taken on empty stomach before night dinner or 2 to 3 hours after dinner before going to bed to reduce the drug concentration and cns effects warn the patients regarding restriction of risky activities such as operating heavy machinery during the initial 2 to 4 weeks of therapy symptoms will usually di- diminish or disappear after 2 to 4 weeks and cons- consider discontinuing ifavirenz if symptoms persist and cause significant impairment in daily function now this is very important if the patient for example is on daily wages and he is losing his job because of that or if the patient is in an occupation which requires alertness and the patient is not able to concentrate or uh, remain alert it is always better to stop ifavirenz and consider alternative therapy alternative pi as a alternative first line regimen now let's see what are the non cns adverse effects there are several non cns adverse effects like liver enzyme abnormalities lipodystrophy hyperlipidemia hypersensitivity and lipomastia or pseudogynecomastia now let's see first the rash the skin rash which occurs it could be of any form it could be maculopapular exfoliative or angioedema in the in this case we have i'll show them uh, show the lesions with the help of a pointer so you can see small tiny raised erythematous lesions which are present and these are mostly on the extensor aspect of the arm these lesions were caused by ifavirenz in a patient and once we had stopped ifavirenz and treated the patient with antihistaminics and antihistaminics all the lesions disappeared now lipomastia or pseudogynecomastia this is a, again a condition which has been increasingly reported with increasing use of ifavirenz now there are two conditions one is gynecomastia and the other is pseudo gynecomastia in gynecomastia along with the breast total enlargement there is increase in the glandular tissue 
that is beneath the areola the glandular tissue increases whereas in lipomastia or pseudogynecomastia there is fatty infiltration the exact pathogenesis is yet to be determined however immune restoration processes and efavirenz mediated estradiol like effects have been said to be contributory to such an effect treatment see how how symptomatic the patient is if the patient has cosmetic disfigurement it is better to discontinue the drug if the patient does not have any cosmetic disfigurement or ha- is asymptomatic does not have any breast pain or tenderness we can continue the drug for those in which the drug is continued we can watch for the effects the effects are likely to reduce with time so uh, there is no exact study which says in how many days this effect will go but as the estradiol mediated effect uh, uh, takes time to disappear this may go within a period of the symptoms may reduce with, within a period of 6 months to 1 year however we can offer them cosmetic surgery that is plastic surgery can be offered to these for patients who have milder sort of pain there are various therapies so for like for other cases of gynecomastia vitamin e in higher doses or evening primrose oil can also be advised in these patients however with stoppage or discontinuation of the drug most of the symptoms settle down i hope some of you have asked questions regarding gynecomastia i hope uh, with my uh, clarification it is uh, uh, satisfies you but if you still have any doubts please free, feel free to email us we'll be happy to answer them now let's go to case 3 i am very sorry for uh, a hurried presentation but uh, because of lack of time i have to be precise and have to complete all those three all the uh, slides so please uh, bear with me now let's go to case 3 a 52 year old male initiated on abacavir lamivudine and ifavirenz has had tenofovir nephrotoxicity develops loose motions and skin rash after 15 days now this is a very tricky situation you have got a patient on abacavir now he has been started on abacavir because he has had tenofovir toxicity in the past now he develops after on <coughs> uh, two weeks of therapy loose motions and skin rash now let's see what it could be see the uh, this is the photograph of this patient same patient and here we have look at the forehead of the patient the forehead looks edematous it has a hyperpigmentation and some scaly lesions the same thing was observed on uh, uh, near his uh, lips and also on his cheek he had severe itching because of this and the loose motions were refracted to antibiotics so when he came to us we diagnosed a abacavir hypersensitivity and we stopped abacavir after stopping abacavir all the symptoms disappeared and the skin rash and the edema over the forehead settled down so whenever such a case is encountered is encountered always remember to stop the drug immediately so let's see what are the side effects of abacavir the common side effects nausea and vomiting malaise headache and diarrhea now abacavir hypersensitivity it is linked to the presence of hla gene less than 5% of adults and children develop it and usually during the first 6 weeks of therapy but may occur at any time now in children this uh abacavir is well very well tolerated more incidences of abacavir hypersensitivity occur amongst adults so as a precautionary measure it is always better to offer the patient testing of for his hla b5701 gene now this testing is available at most of the laboratories uh i uh, at the naco uh, as a part of program this is not done but uh, in most of the cities this test is available so in cases who develop rash to multiple drugs before starting abacavir always make sure that have, you have ruled out hla b5701 rash fever fatigue diarrhea vomiting abdominal pain arthralgia respiratory symptoms increased liver enzymes lymphadenopathy mucous membrane ulcerations are few other manifestations which can occur and this is a potentially fatal form of hypersensitivity stop abacavir and never restart this should be the dictum remembered 
once a patient has had any sensitivity to abacavir should never be rechallenged because rechallenge can turn fatal now this is to summarize the nnrts and the adverse effects so with uh, nevirapin as well as ifavirenz you get such manifestations i have already discussed in those this is just a summary of those now let's go to protease inhibitors the last class uh, from today's lecture toxicity <coughs> so dyslipidemia rise of transaminase hyperglycemia increased bleeding episodes in hemophilic patients osteoporosis and avascular necrosis so let's go to them by specificity atazanavir atazanavir is a very commonly used agent in the second line therapy pi class specific side effects now there are protease class specific side effects which are common to all protease inhibitors hyperglycemia so there are disturbances in the glucose metabolism and especially insulin resistance occurs with the use of protease inhibitors fat maldistribution and hyperlipidemia especially hyperlipidemia is worsens especially with the use of ritonavir as a boosting agent now one rare manifestation increased bleeding episodes in hemophiliacs now hemophilic patients have acquired hiv because initially when the factors were not available they used to be treated with fresh frozen plasma and blood transfusion so transfusion acquired hiv was very common in hemophilic patients so always while treating such patients make sure that when you are using atazanavir there could be increased bleeding episodes and if such such an episode occurs always you need to reconsider therapy now what are the unique side effects of atazanavir indirect hyperbilirubinemia producing yellow discoloration of eyes skin rash and rarely nephrolithiasis that is renal stones now hepatic failure we have a child pew uh, scoring system for at, uh, um, liver dysfunction so if the child pew scores reaches 7 to 9 you have to have a dose of 300 mg once a day and once the child pew scoring goes more than 9 you have to discontinue the drug so in patients who have predisposition to liver disease or patients who have chronic liver disease atazanavir is best avoided and now secondly atazanavir should be taken with food at least 2 hours apart from antacids because now antacids again have a interaction with atazanavir so better time it with food and prevention and treatment with serum bilirubin of more than 4 mg percent it is always advisable to stop atazanavir and never rechallenge unless it is a dire necessity management of skin rash as in other cases so skin rash as i have already discussed needs to be managed with antihistaminics and if uh, rash is severe may need steroid therapy in the form of prednisolone so and i'll be discussing the um, uh, drug reactions in a summary in a few slides later lopinavir lopinavir has got several side effects abdominal pain abnormal stools or bowel movements diarrhea is the most common side effects amongst all and uh, pediatric patients also re report diarrhea with uh, increased incidence however these side effects may be may not be long lasting feeling weak or tired and headache and nausea gastritis related symptoms may occur with increased uh, incidence people taking the drug who have liver disease such as hepatitis b or c may experience a worsening of their liver condition and a small number of patients have experienced serious liver problems so always make sure that hepatitis b or c you have investigated the patient in details and you have also done the latest enzymes that is alt a ast enzymes should be watched before starting lopinavir and if the patient has had elevations in these enzymes you have to always reconsider therapy diabetes mellitus or insulin resistance is one of the feature of pi based therapy and with lopinavir this seems to be aggravated hyperlipidemia also is observed to a greater incidence with lopinavir gynecomastia is again not very well reported but still it can occur and fat redistribution syndromes that is dorsocervical uh, fat pad thickening truncal obesity may occur 
metabolic bone diseases and pancreatitis also can occur as a part of lopinavir therapy so amylase can serum amylase levels can be a very good marker if patients have symptoms relating to those like persistent vomiting or persistent abdominal pain now let's go to hiv therapy induced hyperlipidemia so virtually hiv disease itself can induce hyperlipidemia whereas drugs can be super adding to those now fasting triglyceride may go up to five, more than 500 mg per deciliter total cholesterol may go more than 2 200 mg per deciliter and ldl cholesterol more than 130 mg per deciliter so both as a part of disease and as a part of the drugs this effect can be seen now this is a uh, summary of the adverse effects of art drugs on the lipid profile but as you see in the drug the ldl cholesterol and the total cholesterol seem to be very important and the hdl cholesterol are uh, is reduced with most of the drugs so you have to be very careful if the patient has underlying lipid disorder is hypertensive diabetic or is has ischemic heart disease now this is the approach um, i have also mentioned the reference uh, you have to screen for dyslipidemia as uh, at diagnosis all most of the patients are screened on di at diagnosis itself then on start of antiretroviral therapy and as per guidelines see if dyslipidemia is present so first risk factor modification should be done with dietary lifestyle modification smoking cessation and treatment of underlying condition 10 year cardiovascular risk can be classified uh, patient can be calculated we have got several risk calculators available if the risk is present then patient has to be initiated on lipid lowering therapy or antiretroviral switch therapy however we recommend that a uh, lipid lowering therapy should be initiated as soon as you diagnose with comorbid conditions now treatment of hyperlipidemia now hypercholesterolemia alone if it is present can be managed very well with atorvastatin or pravastatin drugs like simvastatin should not be used because they have severe drug interactions and uh, patient uh, you mean uh, with especially with protease inhibitors now recently a drug called as pitavastatin has been recommended pitavastatin has got additional benefit in terms of less likelihood of developing insulin resistance or less uh, likelihood of developing diabetes pitavastatin can be used at doses of 1 mg 2 mg or maximum 4 mg per day hypertriglyceridemia hypertriglyceridemia we recommend treatment only when the serum triglyceride levels go more than 500 mg per cent phenofibrate is a drug of choice less than that if any level of triglyceride less than 500 mg per deciliter can be taken care of with atorvastatin so phenofibrate if you start aim at a target triglyceride of less lowering tg levels below 200 so dose required is 50 to 160 mg per day so you can start with a low dose and titrate up to 160 mg per day because you should remember both statins and phenofibrate cause cause a myopathy or cramp like syndrome and they may cause elevation of the liver enzymes so always be careful before making any changes in therapy or before uh, increasing the drug dosages always monitor these uh, these forms of therapy with alt and ag uh, <coughs> alt and ast levels now principles of managing adverse effects establish whether the adverse effect is due to arv drugs try to identify the responsible drug and assess the severity using actg grading system i'll be sharing that slide with you and i hope most of you know this slide so uh, grade 1 grade 2 grade 3 and grade 4 according to the hemoglobin the anc is the absolute neutrophil count platelet count alt that is the liver enzymes bilirubin and the creatinine all these with all these you can grade the severity and clinical grading this is an example of clinical grading for example stavudine induced neuropathy or a drug induced rash how you can grade them and grade 3 and grade 4 adverse um, uh, drug reactions you need to stop the drug immediately and never start the drug now before now this is one slide which i would like to share with all of you 
Now, as I mentioned, once patient develops a drug reaction, before stopping the drug, you need to take care that you, drugs can have different half lives. For example, if the patient is on TLE, that is tenofovir lamivudin efavirenz, and the, if the patient develops drug reaction to efavirenz, then do not stop abruptly tenofovir lamivudin con, uh, combination. Because efavirenz has a long half life, it would be like a monotherapy. So, give a tail of TL or there is another way out. You can continue TL <coughs> regimen and you can add on a protease inhibitor. So, it will become alternate first line regimen. If you stop all drugs abruptly, then it, it will act as a monotherapy because the drug levels of the longer half life, drug with longer half life will still remain and patient will develop resistance to the drug. So, zone of potential replication should always be considered while stopping the drugs. Now, these are the references. <coughs> so, I am sorry for being a bit fast, but uh, regarding the time constraint, uh, I have to be uh, rapid with few of the slides. If you have any sort of doubts, you are free, feel free to ask me. I uh, will provide you my email ID. You can contact me on that email ID. These are the references from which these slides have been taken. And uh, last question I can read, the tail of TL. Tail of TL can be given for 7 to 10 days before stopping. So, um, you can go at these references and uh, you can get more details uh, once you go through. This is a very vast topic and it was really challenging. I thank you all for your patient listening. And I'm really, um, I really apologize to you for the technical uh, malfunction what we had initially. Thank you so much. All the participants are requested to kindly enter the e-poll which is going to display on the screen.